According to Norse myth, Baldr, son of Odin and Frigg, was a god of truth and light, and he began having disturbing visions of his own tragic death. So Frigg set out to command every plant, every animal, and every inanimate object in the universe to swear an oath never to harm Baldr. And the plan appeared to work. It worked so well that the other gods would make a game of it during a celebration that was held in honor of Baldr's new invincibility. If nothing in the universe could kill Baldr, then you could throw literally anything in his way and he'd walk away unscathed. And so they did. And that caught the attention of Loki, a god known for playing tricks and generally upsetting the status quo. He was able to find out that Frigg had actually neglected to ask one thing to swear an oath of no harm to Baldr. It was the small and harmless plant that usually was found growing off of other trees. With its tapered oblong leaves and its small white berries, Frigg had assumed that it was harmless to begin with and so there was no need to solicit an oath. Loki went to the forest and found some of the plant and tore off a branch, and then he returned to the party. And there he tricked Baldr's brother to throw the branch at Baldr. The branch pierced Baldr's heart and he died. And that plant was mistletoe. So why would mistletoe play such an important role in a story like that? And how do we get from an ancient myth about it killing a god to a modern custom of kissing beneath it at Christmas time? It's a story of superstitious ancestors, fertility rituals, the Protestant Reformation, and birds doing their business. I'm Brian Earle. This is Christmas Past. Our story begins way back in some indeterminate ancient times, where our ancestors noticed a couple of interesting things about mistletoe. In the first place, it stayed green all year round. And that was interesting enough. Many ancient cultures considered most evergreens to be somehow special. After all, why were they able to stay vibrant in the dead of winter when their woodland companions went dormant? For that reason, they were often thought to have medicinal properties or the power to bring good luck or prevent bad luck. It was common to decorate the home with evergreen foliage like holly and mistletoe during wintertime celebrations, usually for superstitious reasons like to ward off evil or ensure a bountiful crop for the next year. But the second thing they noticed about mistletoe is that it's always found growing high up out of another tree, a tree that would lose its leaves. No other plant did that. How was it possible? There must be something extra special about this plant in particular, they reasoned. And legends existed that the gods dropped mistletoe onto the trees from on high. And so because of its perceived vitality, it became associated with fertility. If only our ancestors knew the real scoop. Mistletoe is a parasitic plant which grows on host trees and the plant uh, lodges into other trees and uh, photosynthesizes but takes its nutrients from the tree. That's Mark Adams. His family owns the Kiss Me Mistletoe Farm in England. Mistletoe relies on animals to propagate. Birds and some other animals would get the sticky berries, which are also the seeds, onto them somehow and then try to rub them off on other trees or a bird could excrete some of the indigestible berries onto a tree, and the bird droppings helped to lodge the seeds onto the tree's surface. In fact, the word mistletoe that we use today is derived from an earlier word in Old English that translates to something like droppings twig. Apparently sometime in the Middle Ages, when Old English was spoken, someone figured out that it wasn't the gods throwing the plant from on high, but rather the birds doing something a little more earthly. Nonetheless, the myths and legends and customs and associations persisted. It was still used medicinally. It still is, actually, or at least as an alternative medicine. And it was still used as part of rituals and customs and wintertime celebrations, of which Christmas eventually became one. We do know, according to historian Jerry Bowler, that some medieval English homes hung an effigy of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, the Holy Family, inside of a wooden hoop decorated with winter greenery under which it was customary to exchange an embrace or kiss. After the Protestant Reformation, that image of the Holy Family disappeared, and the kissing bunch, or kissing bow as it was known, a collection of greenery that often included mistletoe, remained as a Christmas custom. And as a matter of fact, before the Christmas tree became the main evergreen foliage on display in the home at Christmas, which wasn't really all that long ago, it was mistletoe and holly that took that starring role. And that didn't sit too well with some people who saw it as a symbol from pre-Christian times. 
it was actually seen as a, quite a dirty plan by Christianity, so its connection with Christmas has not been that clear cut. In a lot of churches in the UK, it's still banned. It's seen as a pagan plan. Pagans were not seen in the best light in the UK in the few thousand years after. It's also likely that up until the 19th century, that custom of the kissing bow was something you'd see only among the so-called servant class. But eventually it became more widely accepted, along with the English custom of how the kissing worked. But the British tradition is every time you have a kiss, you should take a berry off. So the more berries you have, the more kissing is going to happen. When all the berries are gone, the mistletoe no longer has the power to compel people to kiss underneath it. Though it does serve another use. A common practice in the United Kingdom is regarding what you do with the mistletoe after. One of the traditions is that you keep it for the rest of the year and then only replenish it the next year round. It's supposed to ward off even evil spirits in the pagan tradition. So you keep it up all year so it dies and shrivels up. Now, of course, our American tradition is just a continuation of that English tradition, which isn't the only game in town. Every, all the European countries have slightly different twists on the, how they do it. I know in Italy the tradition is actually to hang the mistletoe up for New Year's Eve rather than for Christmas. And um, in Germany, for example, they do it for the first advent, so they're hanging up all their Christmas decorations a lot earlier, so it's, you know, end of November, start of December. So if it's the Christmas season that has you feeling festively romantic, Mark has some pretty simple advice for you. Just hang up more mistletoe. That's your best way. Everyone remembers their first kiss, whether mistletoe was present or not. It's one of those vivid memories because it comes with so much emotion and sensory engagement, just like a lot of Christmas memories. The warmth of togetherness, the sights and sounds, the anticipation and excitement. We all know that feeling, so we can all relate to Kevin in Chicago who shares this Christmas memory. I have so many amazing Christmas memories, such as my mom making great grandma's Swedish spice cookies, my dad looking overwhelmed with so many tangled and non-working Christmas lights sprawled across the floor, and having all six of us kids sitting at the table like an assembly line stringing popcorn and cranberries to make garland for the Christmas tree. Those were always my favorite trees, and they were even better when my mom would give in to letting us put tinsel on them, which she hated because it got everywhere. Still. I think the most vivid memories were from Christmas Eve, when all six of us would insist upon sleeping in our older sister's room. We had two kids on the bed, two on the trundle bed, and maybe even one or two of us underneath the bed. Clearly, we wanted to be together, but an underlying motive may have been so that no one saw the gifts before anybody else. Even so, in the morning, someone would always sneak out, sneak a peek at the gifts, and they couldn't wait to report back what they saw. Soon all the kids were downstairs and clamoring to get started. But for some reason, it was always harder than usual to get our parents up and out of bed. After enough pleading, after the coffee was made, my dad would read the letter that Santa left for us, which shared all the good things we did, and some improvement areas as well. By and large, we had done just enough to make the nice list. With my dad's huge camcorder ready to go, we finally were allowed to open the gifts one at a time in an attempt to make the magic last. And we were always interested in what everyone else received, because you never knew, maybe their gifts could turn into your gifts as well. I'd love to hear your Christmas memories and I'd love to share them with the rest of the Christmas Past family. It's easy to do and there's still time for this season. Just record a voice memo into your phone and send it to christmaspastpodcast at gmail.com. Try to keep it to roughly a minute, make sure it's clean and family friendly, and be sure to say your name and where you're from. Christmas Past is produced in sunny San Mateo, California by yours truly, Brian Earle. Thanks so much to Kevin in Chicago, and thanks also to Mark at Kiss Me Mistletoe Farm. You can visit them at kissmemistletoe.co.uk. I'd love to know how your Christmas season is going so far, so let's keep in touch. You can send me an email anytime or join the conversation on social media. Just look for Christmas Past on Twitter and Instagram, and do make sure to join the Facebook group because we're having fun there all year round. And if you're feeling the Christmas spirit, why not help more people find the show by telling a friend about it or leaving a review on Apple Podcasts? Those are quick and painless ways to help support the show, and they really do make a difference. 
If you leave a review, I'll even send you a sticker to say thanks. Message me for details. We'll meet again soon, and until then, may your days be merry and bright.